examinations techniques presentation for paper CA 3.7 public sector audit and assurance this paper was first introduced to the program in 2017 and first examined in December 2017 therefore you will notice that it has been examined seven times since the introduction of the paper the syllabus is a short syllabus and it is likely that all the topics in the syllabus will be examined at each and every examination session. This presentation is not meant to be a substitute to adequate preparation for the examinations. The approach that will be taken is that we will consider and look at the key points on each of the areas covered in the syllabus and candidates are expected to go through the contents of the study manual that is provided by the Zambia Institute of Chartered Accountants. Examination relevance will be considered at every stage in covering the key areas of the syllabus. The presentation has been divided into seven parts as follows. The first part will look at the introduction to public sector audits. Part two will look at financial audits in the public sector. Part three will consider performance audits in the public sector. Part four will look at compliance audits in the public sector. Part five will consider IT audits Part 6, Forensic Audits, and in conclusion, and the scenario-based questions will do, be part 7 of the presentation. The objective of the presentation is to give students taking the CA 3.7 Public Sector Audits and Assurance Examination an appreciation of the subject matter by going through the key areas of the syllabus in order to increase their chances of passing the examination at first attempt. Throughout the presentation, reference will be made to past examination questions and also possible ways in which the topics could be examined in future examinations. There is no prior knowledge that is required for a student to take this particular paper. However, knowledge of the following could be advantageous to the students. An understanding of the international standards on auditing for the private sector which are relevant in all aspects in the public sector and will be able to explain as we go through the presentation. A knowledge of how governments operate and the three arms of government, namely the executive, the legislature and the, the judiciary. And also communication skills for the country to be able to communicate effectively without being misunderstood by the examiner. It is important at this stage for candidates to be familiar with the learning outcomes expected as given in the student's handbook. Candidates are expected to be able to define certain terms, to be able to identify from a given scenario certain issues, to be able to make recommendations based on information given, to be able to explain certain concepts as well as apply the theory that they've learned to a scenario that is given in the examination. Candidates should note that the bulk of the learning outcomes are high level, requiring candidates to apply the theory that they've learned to information given in the scenario. The examination, therefore, will be a mixture of uh, knowledge-based questions and application questions. The format of the examination is that there is one compulsory question for 40 marks, which has to be attempted. And then four optional questions out of which candidates are expected to attempt any three questions. And candidates must be clear on the weightings of the topics in the syllabus. Effective auditing and assurance has got a 10% weighting in the syllabus. Public sector audits, a weighting of 15%. Financial audits, a weighting of 20%. Compliance audits, a weighting of 15%. Performance audits, a weighting of 20%. IT audits and forensic audits have a weighting of 10% each. This must give guidance to the students to know which areas to make sure that they clear understanding because the examination will be weighted according to the weightings given in the syllabus. In the first part of the presentation, we are going to look at an introduction to public sector auditing. We will look at auditing and assurance in the public sector. We will look at the Lima Declaration, the Mexico Declaration, value and benefits of the supreme audit institutions, 
transparency and accountability in the supreme audit institutions, quality control in the supreme audit institutions, fundamental principles in public sector audits, both general and those applicable to audits, attestation and direct reporting engagements, and principles of public sector auditing. We'll begin by examining what is meant by auditing, which is basically a concept whereby there is an independent examination by somebody else on what someone else has done with a view to giving assurance to interested parties. Usually, auditing is referred to when we are considering financial statements. It's important to understand that any other subject matter could be subject to an audit and an assurance given to any interested parties. It's important at the onset for candidates to be able to differentiate the difference between audits in the private sector and audits in the public sector. The scope in the private sector audits is mainly on the financial statements and it is limited to forming an opinion on the financial statements prepared by the responsible party. Whereas in the public sector, the scope is much wider than the financial statements. The financial statements are only but a part of the audits that are carried out in the public sector. What happens is that in a democracy, there are three arms of government, namely the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And governments collect taxes from citizens, which they use to spend on public services. These are both direct and indirect taxes that the government collects. Public affairs are supposed to be run in the best interest of the general citizen. So the public is involved in governance through electing representatives to parliament, members of parliament. And then parliament appropriates funds to the government agencies to spend through the annual budget. And these funds that are appropriated by parliament to the government are held in trust for the benefit of the citizens of the country. And therefore, the government and those who hold public funds hold them in trust for the benefit of the public, and therefore they are stewards and are supposed to fulfill their stewardship role of ensuring that the funds are spent in the best interest of the public. Accountability and transparency are therefore key in the public sector, whereby those entrusted with public funds must be made accountable. Accountability and transparency are monitored through having public sector audits conducted by the Supreme Audit Institution, which is the Office of the Auditor General. The purpose of public sector audits is to give assurance to the citizens that the funds that they contribute through taxes are spent in a manner that is beneficial to the general citizenry. And therefore, the People's Representatives Parliament confer responsibility to the government to spend money through the budget. The same parliament confers the responsibility to the public sector audit to carry out audits on how public funds have been spent and to report back to parliament. There are three main types of uh, audits that are conducted in the public sector, namely financial audits, compliance audits, and performance audits. At the world level, at an international level, the International Organization for Supreme Audit Institutions was established, and Zambia is a member of the International Organization for Supreme Audit Institutions. The purpose and objective of this institution is to help countries and governments hold those responsible for using public funds accountable for the public funds. Among its objectives, the InterSci issues standards that are followed by the Supreme Audit Institutions. It, is also, it also helps capacity building in terms of member countries to ensure that they've got the skills and competencies to be able to carry out public sector audits and also knowledge sharing between member countries. The International Organization for Supreme Audit Institutions issued the Lima Declaration, which is an important document which contains a blueprint which is supposed to be followed by member countries when establishing Supreme Audit Institutions of their respective countries. We'll consider the contents of the Lima Declaration a little later from now. Member countries of the International Organization of Supreme Audit Institutions are supposed to establish their own Supreme Audit Institutions in their respective countries. In the case of Zambia, this Office of the Auditor General is the Supreme Audit Institutions. And to a large extent, 
Zambia adheres to the provisions of the Lima Declaration through having constitutional requirements in terms of setting up the Supreme Audit Institution. The following are the concepts of the Lima Declaration, and it is recommended that member countries adhere to these uh, recommendations in setting up their own individual Supreme Court institutions. First of all, a clear distinction must be made between internal and external audits. Internal audits being within the spending institution, external audit is the Supreme Audit Institution who are the external auditors of government. There must be clear guidelines in terms of independence of the Supreme Audit Institution. It must not belong to any of the spending institutions. It must be autonomous and operate independently so that it maintains its objectivity. Also, the members of the Supreme Audit Institutions, the employees, the Auditor General, and the staff of the Supreme Audit Institution must be independent of any institution that they are going to carry out audits. Further, the Supreme Audit Institution is expected to be independent financially and not dependent on any other government institution for funding. For example, the Minister of Finance should not be the one responsible for funding the Office of the Auditor General. Instead, Parliament appropriates funds to run the Office of the Auditor General, again with a view to ensuring that it maintains its financial independence. And it must be clear the relationship between the Supreme Court Institution and Parliament as well as the government. The Supreme Court Institution is acting on behalf of the Public Accounts Committee, which is a committee of Parliament and therefore reports back to the Public Accounts Committee on the outcome of the audit that it will have carried out. The powers of investigation must be clear and contained in the Constitution in accordance with the Lima Declaration. The Supreme Court Institution has got the power and authority to investigate any matter that involves public funds. Enforcement of the Supreme Audit Institutions, by and large, is a requirement that the Supreme Court Institutions should be able to enforce its, recommendation, its, its recommendations to ensure that the audited entities comply or follow the recommendations that have been made. The Supreme Audit Institution has got the mandate to decide on which areas they are going to audit. They are not subject to anybody, not even the president can direct them as to which areas to be audited, should be audited. The Supreme Court institutions must also ensure that they've got the competent staff to be able to carry out the public sector audits. And then there must be international exchanges of experience between member countries of the Intosai. Finally, the Supreme Court institution should have the power to report to parliament as well as to the public on its findings arising from the audits that it carries out. We will now consider code of ethics. Ethics can be explained as expected code of conduct by a particular group of people. Public sector auditors are expected to follow given ethics as given by the International Organization for Supreme Court Institutions. International Standard of Supreme Court Institutions number 30 gives guidance on the code of conduct which is expected to be followed by public sector auditors. It is important to observe that the code should be followed by the institution itself, the Office of the Auditor General, and the members and staff of the institution who are the Auditor General and his staff. There are five fundamental principles or ethical values as defined by the INTOSAI or the International Organization of Supreme Court Institutions. Countries are free to come up with their own ethical values, which are as a bare minimum meet the requirements of the Intosai ethical values. And these five are as follows. Integrity. In the performance of the public sector auditors, the auditors are expected to exhibit integrity, which simply means being straightforward and honest in whatever they are doing. Acting in the public interest and doing so in good faith. The second ethical value is that of independence and objectivity. At all stages during the public sector audit, it is important that the public sector auditors ensure that they are independent of the party that they are auditing. It is only through this independence that they are going to be objective in carrying out their work and give an appropriate uh, opinion. In the event that there is a threat to the independence 
of the public sector auditors suitable safeguards must be applied to remove the threat. The third ethical value is that of competence, which is meant to ensure that the public sector auditors have got the necessary skills and competencies and qualifications to carry out the work that they are supposed to carry out in doing public sector audits. Professional behavior is the fourth ethical value. The public sector auditors should not do anything that will discredit the profession, that will discredit the supreme audit institution, including being involved in corruption within, during the course of the audits. And then finally, confidentiality and transparency. It is important that public sector auditors observe the ethical value of confidentiality, which requires that information obtained through the course of the audit should not be disclosed to third parties unless it is necessary, either legally or it has been authorized by the responsible people. Ethical values are very, very important. From an examination point of view, candidates are expected to identify any ethical lapses in a given scenario and be able to comment and advise what action should be taken to rectify the lapses that may exist in a given scenario. Examination relevance of the material we've covered up to this stage. Candidates should be able to explain the need and the importance of public sector audits to the citizens of the country. Candidates must be very clear on the connection and link between the Supreme Audit Institution, the Public Accounts Committee, and the government. And they should be able to answer knowledge-based questions on the provisions of the Lima Declaration, in addition to being able to advise a country that might want to set up a Supreme Audit Institution on the concepts that it must include in coming up with the Supreme Audit Institutions. For example, the June 2019 Question 2C required students to identify and explain ethical matters in a scenario, whereas the December 2018 Question 2 required students to describe the relevance of ethical values in a forensic investigation. So candidates are expected to use the theory that they learn to apply to a particular situation. We will now look at the Mexico Declaration which was issued by the International Organization for Supreme Audit Institutions. Whereas the Lima Declarations deals with the concepts of establishing a Supreme Audit Institution, the Mexico Declaration deals with issues of independence of the Supreme Audit Institution and the members of the institution. And it has a number of principles as follows. The independence of the Supreme Audit Institutions, in the case of Zambia, the Office of the Order General, must be contained in the Constitution, that is the recommendations of the Mexico Declaration. The tenure of office of the head of the Supreme Audit Institutions must also be contained in the Constitution. It's only in this way that independence can be a, a guaranteed, so that he does not fear to be removed for performing his duties. The Constitution must provide that the Supreme Court Institution must be free to select the subjects of public sector audits. And the mandate of the institution is broad. There are no restrictions. The Supreme Court Institution should be able to audit any institution that spends public funds. The Constitution must also clearly state that the Office of the Auditor General, the Supreme Court Institution, has got unrestricted access to any information that they require in the carrying out of their, their, their audit. And they must have the right to report on the outcome, on the findings of the audit without consulting any other person before releasing such report. The Supreme Court Institutions must be free to decide on the contents and format and timing of the audit report that they issue after the audit is carried out and be able to make follow-ups of the recommendations that will have been made in the report. And finally, financial and managerial autonomy must be contained in the constitution so that the Supreme Court institution does not depend on any other ministry or in any other government institution for funding. The December 2017 examination, question 2A required candidates to describe the contents of the Mexico Declaration 
for eight marks. Students were required to exhibit knowledge about the provisions of the Mexico Declaration. The June 2019 examination, question 1b, part, so part 1, required students to evaluate the adherence to this by the Supreme Court institution of the Republic of East Africa with the provisions of the Mexico Declaration. This was an application requirement requiring students to evaluate whether the Republic of East Africa complied with the provisions of the Mexico Declaration. And so it's important that you go through the requirements and fully understand the requirements of the Mexico Declaration. Candidates may also be required to apply the theory and knowledge on the Mexico Declaration to a given scenario. For example, in June 2019, the examiner required the candidates to evaluate adherence of the Mexico Declaration by a Supreme Court institution of the Republic of East Africa. We move on to another standard by the International Organization for Supreme Audit Institutions. This is ESI number 12, which deals with value and benefits of the Supreme Audit Institutions. This refers to the benefits of having the Office of the Auditor General, for example, in Zambia to the general public. And it is because there is funding that goes to sustain the operations of the institutions. And so it is important to, for students to understand that the Supreme Court institution aims at promoting accountability and transparency on the part of those entrusted with the public funds. And the standard gives three objectives of value and benefits, which we will explain now. The first one is to strengthen accountability, integrity, and transparency. The very existence of the Supreme Court institution strengthens accountability, integrity, and transparency on the part of those who spend public funds. And also, the Supreme Court institution helps those charged with governance, those who are supposed to oversee how public funds are spent, who are the Public Accounts Committee, perform their duty. And then ultimately, to report on the outcome of the audits that they, they, they carry out. The second objective of the Supreme Court institution is to demonstrate its ongoing relevance. This is achieved by scanning the environment and by the Supreme Court institutions responding to the risks that arise in the environment in terms of where funds are most likely to be lost and react promptly and to be able to be a source of uh, independent and objective guidance uh, for beneficial change in the way public funds are spent. The final objective of value and benefit of the Supreme Court institution is that of being a role model organization. Students should understand that the Supreme Court institution is funded by public funds and therefore it should be able to be above board and do that which it expects the stewards of public funds to do. For example, they must lead by example in terms of transparency and accountability in the way they spend public funds in the institution, the Supreme Court institution or the office of the Auditor General. They must lead by example in terms of uh, good governance in the way they run the office of the Auditor General and following the code of ethics and striving for excellency in whatever they do. Only then can have the moral obligation to actually audit or expect other people to be transparent and accountable in terms of public expenditure. ESA number 12 and the examination. Students should be able to answer knowledge-based questions on the provisions of this standard, as was the case in the December 2018 examination, where a knowledge-based question required candidates to explain four principles of value and benefits of the SAI under the objective of being role model organization. Students should be able to apply the theory in the scenario to evaluate to what extent the Supreme Court institution with the three objectives of, adheres or complies with the three objectives of value and benefits. We'll move on to ESI number 20, which deals with transparency and accountability. It's important to note that this is transparency and accountability in the office of the Auditor General, in the Supreme Audit institution and not necessarily in the audited entities. 
The Supreme Audit Institution is accountable for meeting its obligation with regards the performance of audits and also with regards the use of the resources that are appropriated to it to carry out its functions. Transparency simply means timely, reliable, clear and relevant public reporting by the SAI to make public its findings and conclusions without hiding anything. There must be clear transparency by the Supreme Court institutions. Transparency can help fight corruption. Transparency by the Supreme Court institution can improve governance. Transparency by the Supreme Court institution can promote accountability on the part of the stewards of public funds. December 2019, question 4A required candidates to explain the importance of the two principles of accountability and transparency in public sector auditing. We we'll move on to ESI number 40, which is on quality control for the size. This standard aims at ensuring that the Supreme Audit Institutions carries out audits of a high quality which can be relied upon in terms of the report that is issued. And so it is the contents of ESI number 40 are drawn from the International Standard on Quality Control number 1, which gives guidance on the quality control at the firm level. And therefore, students are expected to be aware of the elements of quality control covered in ESI number 40, which are namely leadership responsibility for quality in the office of the Auditor General, relevant ethical requirements and complying with ethical requirements is part of quality as well, acceptance and continuous of audits or relationships, human resources ensuring that the office of the Auditor General has got the necessary skills and competencies to carry out the work and also quality control at the individual audit level. There must be quality control measures put in place by the Supreme Court institution at the individual audit level. And then to ensure that quality control is operating throughout through monitoring system, having a monitoring system to ensure that the quality control measures put in place remain relevant. And where they don't or they fall short, measures are put in place to correct that. Students should be able to explain quality control in the Supreme Court institutions as required by ESI number 40, as was the case in the June 2018 examination. Question 4C of the June 2019 exam required candidates to discuss quality control deficiencies using information in the scenario, which means students needed to know the theory and then be able to apply that theory to a given scenario and comment whether or not there has been adherence to the provisions of ESI number 40. We will now move on to look at the fundamental principles of public sector auditing. There are four standards that are important and that students should be very clear of. We will start by looking at ESI number 100, which is principles of public sector auditing. Whether you are laying down foundations for your business or restructuring market goals, it's important to have professionals that you can trust. Chartered accountants are key to business growth to help you bring your ventures to the world. That's why you should make sure you have a CA Zambia on board. CA Zambia is a globally recognized chartered accountancy qualification that ensures our chartered accountants uphold international standards and stay informed on the best accounting practices worldwide. Keep your business growth healthy. Go with a CA Zambia Certified Accountant. CA Zambia, developing business leaders. In part two of the presentation, we are going to consider financial audits in the public sector. And in this part, we will look at the provisions of the ESI 200, which are the fundamental principles applied to financial audits. We will look at financial audits in general, and then finally, we will compare international standards of supreme audit institutions with international standards in auditing, which are used in the private sector. ESI 200, fundamental principles of financial auditing, has got principles specifically tailored to financial audits. It draws these principles from ESI number 100, which has got general principles 
applied across all the areas of public sector auditing. Financial audits are carried out on financial statements prepared, for example, by companies under the IDC, such as Zesco or Lusaka Water and Storage, and so on. Financial audits could also be carried out on programs that are run by ministries, for example, or any financial record that is maintained by the ministries or spending agency. Financial audits have got three elements, namely the responsible party, which is the party that is being audited, the users, including the legislature or parliament in this case, and then the public sector audit himself, the supreme audit institutions. We must be able to identify the three elements of a financial audit. The general principles of financial auditing in the public sector include the following, and as explained earlier, they are drawn from ESI 100, and others are incorporated in here in ESI 200. The matters that must be considered in a financial audit include the following. Audit risk, which is basically the three elements of audit risk, namely inherent risk, control risk, and detection risk. The application of professional skepticism throughout the performance of the financial audit, whereby the public sector auditor is supposed to observe professional skepticism throughout the carrying out of the audit. This is having a questioning mind so that the public sector auditor is able to highlight or to see potential areas where problems could exist. Another principle is that of professional judgment. The public sector auditor is expected to apply professional judgment in carrying out uh, his work. This is derived from the knowledge and the skills that the public sector auditor has. And a number of areas where professional judgment is applied include the determination of materiality and audit risk, the nature and the timing of substantive audit work that is going to be carried out, determining the number of items to test, and indeed drawing conclusions from the evidence that has been gathered. These are all matters of professional judgment. Materiality should also be considered in uh, financial audits. The concept should be applied with caution in the public sector because the public sector auditor cannot decline or withdraw from an engagement on account of materiality as compared to a private sector audit where they may do so. Principles related to the financial audit process. The public sector auditor needs to agree the terms of the engagement through the preparation of an engagement letter. There must be a clear understanding of the entity or institution or program being audited. The auditor must understand what it is that they are going to audit. They must carry out risk assessment so they identify the areas where things could go wrong and concentrate their audit effort on those areas. And then the auditors should also be able to respond to the risks that have been identified. Response could be by way of closer supervision or assigning more experienced staff to carry out the audit in areas where there is a, a high risk of things going wrong. And fraud should be considered throughout the audit process as well as going concern consideration, although this is less important in public sector compared to the private uh, sector. Throughout the audit process, the public sector auditor should gather sufficient appropriate evidence, sufficient in terms of quality of the evidence. And then they must be able to evaluate the misstatements or uncorrected misstatements that they come across during the audit. And finally, form an opinion and report on the financial statements through an audit report. We will now look at financial audits in the public sector and consider general points across this particular uh, part. Financial audits deal with audits of financial statements similar to those of the private sector. Public sector auditors also follow laid down standards, namely international standards for supreme audit institutions. We will now look at the general points with regards to financial audits in the public sector. We are going to illustrate this using uh, financial statements of a public company publicly owned company, such as the Zambia Electricity Supply Corporation, for example. The financial audit will deal with uh, financial statements in a similar manner to those that we deal with in the private sector. 
and the public sector auditor is required to follow the laid down standards, namely the international standards for supreme audit institutions, which contain provisions of how the financial audits should be carried out. It is important to note that the International Organization for Supreme Audit Institutions uses the same standards with those used in the private sector. The only difference is the name. In the case of a private audit, they are known as International Standards on Auditing. In the case of public sector audits, they are International Standards for Supreme Audit Institutions. The INTOSAI adopted the ISAs issued by IFAC and they are relevant in the CA 3.7 examination. The ISA is accompanied by a practice note, and the easiest way to remember the ISA is, is to remember the ISA equivalent. The only difference is the numbering. For example, ISA 315 is ISA 1315 in public sector auditing. ISA 700 is ISA 1700 in public sector auditing. And so financial audits are a major part of the CA 3.7 syllabus at 20 percent of the syllabus so the provisions of these standards are very very important and the provisions of the ESAs are exactly the same or similar to those of the ESAs and so it's important that candidates are familiar with the ESAs is provided in the private sector it's therefore necessary to make reference to the provisions of the standards in 3.2 which candidates are required to sit for before attempting the paper 3.7 examination. Candidates are referred to the provisions of the standards in, under the private sector audits under ESAs. In the event that candidates cannot remember the provisions of the international standards on auditing, they are encouraged to go back and study and fully understand the provisions of the standards. For example, let us look at ESAI 1315, which is identifying and assessing the risk of material misstatement through understanding the entity and its environment. In carrying out a financial audit in the public sector, the public sector auditors are required to identify and assess the risks that might exist in that particular entity that they are going to, uh, to audit. This is with a view to identify the risk areas and respond appropriately in accordance with ESAI 1330. And candidates should be able to suggest suitable responses to the risks that have been identified. Suffice to say that candidates must fully understand the provisions of the standards in the private sector and apply those to the public sector because the contents remain exactly the same. In terms of examination questions on financial audits in the public sector, all the standards that have been listed in this presentation are examinable. Candidates must understand the assertions contained in the figures in the financial statements being audited. The examiner expects students to answer questions on financial audit in line with the provisions of the standards. And so candidates should fully understand the provisions of all the standards and must revise and ensure that they fully understand them if they have to score high marks in this particular section. Let's run through one or two examples of how this has been examined in the past. The December 2017 exam, question five, required students to explain risks and responses to the risks that have been identified using the information in the scenario. Question 4 of the June 2018 exam required students to show knowledge of receivable sacralizations. 2019 June required candidates to explain three given methods of obtaining evidence and also the limitations of using analytical procedures in accordance with the provisions of ESI 1520. And so candidates are encouraged to go through all the standards fully and ensure that they understand the provisions of those standards and be able to uh, answer questions on audit procedures in the public sector financial audits. Part three of the presentation will look at performance audits in the public sector. And this is 20% of the syllabus weightings. We'll look at the meaning of performance auditing the parties to a performance audit, the provisions of ESI 300, which gives the principles 
of performance auditing in the public sector, the general requirements of performance auditing in accordance with ESI 3000, the main stages of performance auditing, the elements and principles of performance audits, the central concepts for performance auditing, and then reporting on the outcome of performance audits. Performance audits can be defined or explained as value for money audits, which deal mainly with the three E's, being economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. Economy meaning minimizing the cost. In other words, the resources to an activity should be obtained at the best price. Efficiency, getting the, the most out of available resources. It's a measure of the output from a given input. Could we produce more with this same given input, with these resources that have been used? Effectiveness considers whether or not the intended objectives have been met. It's very important under performance audit to understand the principles of economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. The three parties to a performance audit include the practitioner, in this case, the public sector auditor, the responsible party, who is the auditee, and the intended user for whom the performance audit report is prepared and issued. ESI 300 gives the fundamental principles of performance auditing in the public sector. Again, the provisions are drawn from ESI 100, which is the general principles across all the types of uh, public sector auditing. The fundamental principles of performance auditing as itemized in ESI 300 are as follows. First one, the audit objective in performance auditing must be clearly defined. And this should relate to the principle of economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. The approach that will be taken in the carrying out of the performance audit could either be a systems-oriented approach or a result-oriented approach or a problem-oriented approach where you examine or analyze causes of a particular problem. The criteria in a performance audit must be defined. We need to establish what is it that we are going to compare the actual activity against. The criteria must be uh, defined. It may be what should be done, what it should be, or what is expected, or indeed what it could be. Risk uh, should also be managed properly in a performance audit. Aspects of risk required in consideration could be lack of competencies and skills, the risk that the public sector audit doesn't have the competencies and the skills to actually do the work, or failing to access quality information uh, or obtaining inaccurate information. Risk must be considered. And there must be communication throughout the audit process between the public sector auditor and the entity that is being audited, the management of the entity that is being audited. And materiality must also be considered. These are the principles of performance auditing. In terms of general requirements of carrying out a performance audit, again, is contained and drawn from ESI 100 and ESI 300. There must be independence of the auditor again, so that he remains impartial and objective. The public sector auditor, when going to carry out a performance audit, must ensure that independence is maintained at all times. And if there's any lack of independence, safeguards should be applied to redress that. Then they, what they, there must be an identification of the intended users and the responsible party by the auditor. We must know, the public sector auditor must know who is the intended user of this uh, performance audit and who is the responsible party that we are auditing. And then the auditor must identify the subject matter or the program undertaking or system or fund subject to the performance audit. Communication about the outcome of the audit must obviously be considered as well. And then they set up the audit objective clearly in terms of the principles of economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. The choice of the approach, whether the auditor will use a result-oriented approach, a problem-oriented approach, or a systems-oriented approach. The criteria is already mentioned. The audit criteria should be suitable because this is the one against which the subject information will be compared and the issue of risk will also be considered. 
Okay. And in communication of the key aspects of the audit with the auditee and other relevant stakeholders throughout the audit process must be maintained. The work that is being carried out in a performance audit must be properly supervised by competent people within the Office of the Auditor General. Innovation in terms of reacting to changing situations and being flexible is important in carrying out the performance audits. Quality control in line with the provisions of ESI number 40 should be observed throughout the performance audit and materiality, of course, should be considered in carrying out performance audit by the public sector auditors. The main stages of performance audits include selecting of topics or selecting of subjects to be audited. This is made through the strategic plan of the Office of the Auditor General. And in having selected the topic, there's planning uh, the audit, which is, involves pre-study or understanding, gaining an understanding of the entity or program being uh, audited and then designing procedures which will assist in gathering evidence and then submission of the plan to superiors, obviously, for approval before the work is actually done. Once it has been planned, then the audit is conducted to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence which should be very relevant, valid, and reliable. After conducting the audit, based on the evidence that is gathered, the public sector auditor then will have to report and make up follow-up on the recommendations that were made in the performance audit report that has been issued to the responsible party.